Welcome students. This is your introduction to experiment number eight, assets and bases. And this will be part A of the experiment, which normally is done in two days. First, thing we're gonna start is by making some definitions here. This one is by Svante Arrhenius, a 19th century scientist who actually won the Nobel Prize in 1903. And the definition by Arrhenius of what an asset or a base are is based on the question, what happens when we put the substance in water? Very simply, an acid is a substance that when you put it in water, it produces hydrogen ions. Let's represent a hypothetical acid here by the formula HX. You can see how when you put it in water, it produces hydrogen ions and a corresponding anion. A base, on the other hand, produces hydroxide ions. And you can see it here with the uh, imaginary base QOH producing Q ions and then hydroxide ions. Let's look at some examples of some acids that you might have come in contact with or known about. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. This is hydrogen chloride dissolved in water. Again, it produces hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Nitric acid, notice that it produces hydrogen ions and nitrate ions. Notice that both HCl and HNO3 are actually molecular compounds. They're all non-metals. However, when you put them in water, they ionize. Notice that when they ionize, the hydrogen ion is one species, but the rest of the molecule stays either as a monatomic, like an HCl producing chloride, or a polyatomic ion, just like nitric acid produces nitrate ions. Because these two compounds produce one hydrogen ion per formula unit, we say that these are monoprotic acids. Compare that with, or con contrast that with sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and when it ionizes, you can see that for every molecule of sulfuric acid, two units of the hydrogen ion are produced. And because of that, we call this a diprotic acid. We're going to encounter later on acids that we will release three and four hydrogen ions per molecule. We'll call those polyprotic acids. Now, how do we know that hydrogen or hydroxide ions are actually being produced when these substances dissolve in water? Well, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to prepare some test solutions. These are all here on uh, step number one of part A on the first page of your handout. You're going to take 20 milliliters of a six molar solution of KOH that you're going to be provided, and you're going to dilute it into the appropriate volume of water to obtain a solution that is approximately 0.5 molar in KOH. Similarly, you're going to take five milliliters of a six molar HCl solution and dilute it into the appropriate volume of water to obtain a solution that is approximately 0.5 molar. The third test solution is going to be sodium chloride. You're going to take a small amount of sodium, solid sodium chloride, add it to a test tube, and add about five milliliters of water. Now, a couple of things here. First of all, when it says water here, please note that whenever you ask to mix chemicals with water, it is assumed that you need to use distilled water. Remember, tap water has substances dissolved in it that could interfere or otherwise affect our results. So we use distilled water for making these kinds of mixtures. The other thing is, notice that you're being asked to start with a concentrated solution, or let's say KOH and HCl, and dilute them to a lower concentration, to a more dilute solution. Remember that we learned in unit four of our lessons that we had to use the dilution formula. So MIVI equals MFVF. That's I for initial, F for final. So you're going to be asked to calculate what should be the final volume of the solution you're going to make when you dilute both the KOH and the HCl. Now, the tests we're going to do with these solutions, the first one's going to be the litmus paper test. Litmus paper is a paper that's been coated with a chemical that changes color depending on whether the substance that it comes in contact with is acid or base. So you can see here, we have two kinds of litmus paper. You have a red or pink litmus paper and a blue litmus paper. And you can see here that the red litmus paper does not change with acid, but with an alkali or base solution, it turns blue. 
The blue litmus paper in the presence of acid turns red or pink, but in the presence of alkali, which is another word for basic or base, it doesn't have any changes. The other test we're going to do is a flame test. As we explained in the procedures video that you'll watch later on, substances that have ions in them have their electrons arranged in certain ways uh, by different energy levels. And when you provide outside energy, for example, in the form of heat, they absorb some of that energy and then they release it in the form of light. And because of the different arrangements of electrons, the color of light that is emitted is different depending on the substance. Here's an example of some flame tests for different uh, metal ions, zinc, potassium, strontium, sodium, and copper. And you can see the different colors that the flames have whenever they burn one of these ions. The third test we're going to do is an indicator test. Just like the substance that coats litmus paper, there are many other chemicals that change colors depending on whether they are in a acid or a base solution. The one we're going to use is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein in the presence of acid is colorless, but in the presence of base achieves a neon pink color. So we're going to use this as a test to distinguish between a substance that is an acid and a substance that is a base. The last test that we're going to study is something called neutralization. Let's say that I take a mixture of an acid and a base solution. Let's start with the acid. Here is a solution of acid, HCl, and we know it's an acid because according to the equation, it produces hydrogen ions in water. The second solution is a base, sodium hydroxide solution. Notice that we know it's a base because in water it produces hydroxide ions. Now, what if I were to combine these two solutions? Let's simply add down all of these entities here, all these species, and we're going to get this long equation here. But if you observe this, you could group some of these product ions. For example, you could group the sodium and the chloride ions and the hydrogen and the hydroxide ions. And actually, you could kind of like show them in a molecular way in the form of sodium chloride aqueous and water, which would be liquid. In other words, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions give you H2O. So if you look at the products of this combination of an acid and a base solution, what do you get? You have a salt solution and water. In other words, there's no more acid or base in the product solution. That's what we call it a neutralization. We would say that the acid and the base solutions neutralized each other. And the resulting solution is simply salt dissolved in water. So if you were to vaporize the water, you'd be left with the sodium chloride solid as a residue. In other words, the ions would kind of like repack into the typical crystal structure of a ionic compound. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Please have your experiment aid handout at hand. First, you're going to fill in the dilution calculations for part A, step one. In other words, how are you going to make these solutions of KOH and HCl? Then you're going to watch the procedures and observations video where I walk you through not only the procedures, but also what are the observations you're going to be making. And as you go watching this video, please record the data in your handout. Now, the last step of the procedures, step number five, which is on page three, is not shown in the video. So please read through the instructions. And what you're going to do is you're going to record your predictions of the expected results. OK, so that's kind of like more of a thought experiment uh, as opposed to a visual or physical experiment you're going to carry out. All right. So please go ahead and move on to the next video and have your handout with you so you can fill in the blanks. And then after that, we're going to go to part B of this activity. Thank you so much.